tonight on NJ Spotlight News. Crisis averted for now. Legislative committees advance a historic $54 billion budget in a late night session. The largest spending plan ever now heads for a full vote. The, the Constitution requires that to be in place by midnight on June 30th or the, the government would shut down. Plus, affirmative action struck down. The U.S. Supreme Court overturns a 40-year-old legal precedent, now banning race as a factor for college admission. You don't simply wave a magic wand in all of the ways in which the pernicious forms of racial discrimination have been used and have been used to, to uh, uh, hoard opportunity. Also, alleged union busting. Two former American dream workers appear in federal court after being fired. They claim it was for union organizing. And New Jerseyans brace for code red air quality alerts as Canadian wildfire smoke returns. NJ Spotlight News begins right now. Funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term sustainable clean energy future for New Jersey. From NJPBS, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venosi. Good evening and thanks for joining us this Thursday night. I'm Brianna Venosi. Well, with just minutes to spare, legislative budget committees late last night approved the largest spending plan in state history. Democrats pushed through the $54.3 billion budget along party lines, narrowly meeting a deadline to avoid a government shutdown. The final plan includes most of Governor Murphy's original proposal, a $7 billion payment to the public worker pension system, full funding for the Anchor Property Tax Relief Program, expanding the child tax credit, free state parks, and money for the new Stay NJ Senior Tax Relief Program. But it also adds about a billion dollars in new spending, amounting to a roughly 60 percent increase in state spending since Governor Murphy took office in 2018. All of that added to Republicans' protests and frustrations last night, accusing Democrats of a lack of transparency and public input for throwing a bill together, they say, behind closed doors, saying they never got to look at the budget document before the vote. Has your side of the aisle seen a full budget document at this point in time? Because my caucus hasn't seen a full budget document. We've only seen score sheets, which we've been told may be not 100 percent accurate at this point in time if i may i mean we've seen a full budget document and accuracy is in the eye of the beholder whether it's if we're voting on what we have in front of us accuracy is perhaps people are suggesting it's inaccurate because it's not the understanding of what we suggested but we're voting on what we have before us if we, if we find any inaccuracy we'd have to change it but we're going to vote on it the way it is Budget and finance writer John Reitmeyer was at the State House until the bitter end and says the drama is commonplace in the process, but... It's a little bit embarrassing for leadership, especially on the eve of a, of a full legislative election year. All 120 seats, including the seats of the Assembly Speaker and the Senate President, are on the ballot this fall. And certainly it's not a good look to be going into a full legislative election with this sort of uh, confusion through, again, what's really the most important bill that gets enacted in Trenton. In a landmark decision, the U.S. Supreme Court today struck down the use of race in college admissions. The affirmative action case involved Harvard and the University of North Carolina. The 6-3 to three ruling by the court said the admissions policy, which gives weight to a potential student's race, is unconstitutional, reversing a long-standing precedent that's benefited black and Latino students in higher education. Affirmative action policies were put in place to address decades decades of discrimination and increased diversity in college settings. But the majority opinion says the programs, quote, involve racial stereotyping and lack meaningful endpoints. 
The case against Harvard accused the university of discriminating against Asian American students by requiring higher test scores, among other factors, to limit the numbers accepted. Well, President Biden today had this to say about the decision. We cannot let this decision be the last word. I want to emphasize, we cannot let this decision be the last word. While the court can render a decision, it cannot change what America stands for. America is an idea, an idea unique in the world. The implications here are widespread. Joining me to help explain this decision and what it'll mean moving forward is Kim Mutcherson, co-dean and professor of law at Rutgers Camden. Kim, it's good to see you. Um, first, off the bat, your reaction to what will, uh, of course, be a decision that dramatically alters college admissions across the country. Yeah, I mean, I certainly can't say that I am surprised. A lot of us in higher education have been watching this case. Obviously, um, we know what the makeup is of the, of the Supreme Court is right now. And we know that this is a court that doesn't mind overruling precedent, even precedent that's been around for a very, very long time. So certainly I'm not surprised by the decision that we saw today. Um, and a lot of us have been preparing for it for quite some time. Chief Justice Roberts uh, took an unusual step, I'll say unusual, in actually going further and explaining this decision, saying that there's some nuance really here, that schools shouldn't automatically uh, ignore race, um, but should consider it more broadly. Um, what does he mean by that? Well, first thing that I'll say is that I think it's a it's it's really confusing um, in the way that the court talks about how schools have used race in the past. It's been a very very long period of time um, when the Supreme Court has told us that you can use race, but you cannot have quotas. So none of us have had quotas, obviously, and that it has to be part of a holistic admissions process. The second thing, though, which Justice Roberts, I think is saying to us um, is that if you have a student whose essay really speaks to their experience as a member of a marginalized community in the United States, so a black student who writes an essay um, that talks about how race has impacted um, that person's life, to the extent that that information um, can be used to convey this is a student who has an enormous amount of grit, this is a student who has an enormous amount of perseverance, this is a student who has had to overcome substantial, substantial obstacles, um, that that would still be allowed. But we heard really strong dissent from Justice Sotomayor, Justice uh, Ketanji Brown uh, Jackson, uh, who said that they, the, the majority was in a let them eat cake oblivious really talking about this country's past and, and being, in her words, you know, ignorant to what is still the present, basically talking about systemic racism. Absolutely. And I love what Justice Jackson said, right? So she, she talked about, uh, she wrote, history speaks. Um, and I think that that is so important. We do not move past what this country has done historically for centuries to people of color, particularly people who have histories of being enslaved in this country. You don't simply wave a magic wand and all of that disappears. You don't simply wave a magic wand and all of the ways in which the pernicious forms of racial discrimination have been used and have been used to, to uh, uh, hoard opportunity um, in this country. You can't simply write a sentence that makes those things go away, right? You really have to be able to take the history of this country into account as we think about the kind of future that we want to forge. And that, I think, is what Justice Sotomayor um, and Justice Jackson are telling us. Do you think, Kim, that this is going to build pressure to reshape the advantages that are there for uh, legacy applicants, so, you know, children of alumni, um, the, the very wealthy, the connected, et cetera, um, because there is a lot of discussion around the fact that the affirmative action is not ending for those people. Yeah, and of course, there's been lots of talk about that for a very long time, and you do have some schools that have started talking about um, getting rid of legacy admissions. But, you know, going back to Justice Sotomayor and Justice Jackson, part of what they talk about is the, are the many ways in which <laughs> advantage starts very young in this country. So it's not just that your parents and grandparents went to Harvard and so you get you know, a thumb on the scales uh, as a legacy admission. Um, it's that your parents and grandparents are college educated, that that means that they've had particular types of jobs, that that means that they've been able to create particular kinds of educational opportunities for you. Perhaps it means that they got a tutor to help you study for the SATs, that they hired an expert to help you write your applications. All of that 
is a part of what makes this talk about, oh, it should all be about merit and not about anything else, um, that makes it so foolish, right? Because we know that merit is often based on um, where people are born and who their parents are. Um, and that's not about a skill set, right? And it's not about hard work. Um, it's about that some people get born, um, you know, as, as, as Ann Richards said, right? Some people are born on third base, right? And think that they hit a triple. Kim Mutcherson is the co-dean and a law professor at Rutgers Camden. Kim, thanks so much for your thoughts today. Thanks for having me. After facing legal action from the state, the Manalapan English Town School District wants to meet with New Jersey's Attorney General to negotiate. School leaders are hoping to work out an agreement on a controversial policy requiring parental notification if students alter their gender identity. Attorney General Matt Platkin's office is in legal disputes with a handful of school districts over similar proposals, filing civil complaints against Manalapin, Hanover, Middletown, and and Marlboro school districts for policies the state says outs gay and transgender students, violating what's known as LAD, that's the New Jersey Law Against Discrimination. At a heated Board of Education meeting in Colts Neck last night, impassioned parents and community members crowded a school gym debating a gender identity policy affecting the very youngest of their students. Senior correspondent Joanna Gagas reports. No one knows my kids better than me. And no one will get between me and my children. We are gravely concerned with proposed policies that put student safety and mental health at risk and violate New Jersey's law against discrimination. The debate played out in yet another school district last night, whether the Colts Neck Board of Education should put a policy in place that requires educators to inform parents when a student between the age of pre-K to fifth grade comes out to them about their gender identity. Regarding their, their mental, medical, and emotional health, keeping that information from the parents, uh, to me is just, as a father, is. Absolutely immoral. The signs here say we're here for you as if they're inviting our children to cross the line against parents and make parents the adversary. I think that in the best interest of children, you should definitely reconsider and vote no. Don't force these children to tell their parents anything if they're not comfortable. Beyond the heated emotional debate, some in the district reminded the board that adopting this policy would land Colts Neck in the same legal battle as four other districts, Hanover, Middletown, Marlboro, and Manalapan English Town. New Jersey's attorney general has filed civil rights complaints against all four districts. Hanover's policy has been paused while the other three remain locked in a legal dispute. Lawsuits cost money. Why on purpose would we go headlong into a lawsuit? What is that going to cost us? What will the children have to give up for this nonsense? Should we give up the school play? How about sports? Let's get rid of that so that we can go headlong into this battle. I'm outraged that after three other districts in this county have passed the law and have been sued by the state, that Colts Neck is continuing to pursue this policy change. I think that it is a ridiculous waste of taxpayer money. They're going to be buried in legal bills. And aside from just the accountability and responsibility they, they have to their township, they, have an, they need to be held accountable for their students. They need to protect their trans students, their queer students. But Sean Highland, former executive director of the New Jersey Family Policy Alliance, thinks these districts could win in court. There is no precedent there is no settled case law that NJ LAD has ever been applied in any manner that would prohibit parents from being informed about their child's social, emotional, and mental well being. The AG has simply decided on his own to apply NJ LAD in a manner that sidelines parents and removes them from the process. NJ LAD is New Jersey's law against discrimination, which the suits say these policies violate. But in the end, uncertainty around those cases led the Colts Neck School Board to postpone last night's vote. I'd like to make a motion to postpone to a certain time or table the second reading of policy 5756 until such time that the current lawsuits filed by the Attorney General and pending against the four school district have been resolved. For Michael Gottesman, who's been challenging these policies in board meetings across the state, that postponement is a win. That could take years. So 
unless they vote again and say they're going to undo that, they're stuck until the issue, the legal issue, is resolved with the administrative courts or the courts of the state of New Jersey. A possible turning of the tide in what many thought would be a wave of districts adopting this policy. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Joanna Gagas. Well, the man at the center of a murder for a hire scheme that rocked New Jersey politics has been sentenced to 24 years in federal prison. Prosecutors called for 15 years. Former political consultant Sean Cattle pleaded guilty last year to hiring two hitmen who murdered Michael Galdari. Cattle's former colleague in his Jersey City apartment then set the building on fire. In court filings, Cattle said he had Galdari killed because he was extorting money from him and threatening to ruin his career. Cattle could have faced life in prison for his crimes, but he struck a deal with the FBI to provide information for other investigations and had been awaiting his sentencing at home rather than in jail. The two men charged with murdering Galdieri have already been sentenced. Bomani Africa received a 20-year sentence. George Bratsinas got 16 years. So far, just one other conviction has come from Cattle's cooperation. Tony Teixeira, the former chief of staff of state Senate President Nick Scuteri, pleaded guilty to tax evasion last year. Teixeira is scheduled to be sentenced on July 24th. A site of decades-old pollution in Trenton is finally getting cleaned up with the help of a $2 million federal grant from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. The industrial site dates back to the 1800s. It was once home to a pottery factory, coal storage, a gas station, and most recently, a dry cleaning business. Well, the chemicals used in that work caused significant soil and groundwater pollution, posing health threats to neighbors. Now, officials say they're finally achieving some environmental justice. Ted Goldberg has the story. The inside of this former dry cleaner in Trenton looks like something out of a horror movie. It's been vacant for eight years, but it could get cleaned up thanks to a federal grant funded by the infrastructure law passed in 2021. We want to bring new homes here. We want to bring new people to live in this community. We want to uh, be able to have the people that live here live in a safe environment. This is a corridor. People come into the, the capital city down this corridor. And we want them to be welcomed with the beauty that really resonates in this historic uh, city. The dry cleaner was the latest in a string of industrial businesses hosted here over the past 100 plus years. After Trenton asked the EPA to look over the site, they found large amounts of tetrachloroethylene in the soil a common compound used by dry cleaners. The chemicals industry creates some wonderful product and it, and it does seemingly magical things like cleaning our clothes. But years later, we come to find out that that magical thing is actually really, really bad. It can pollute our environment. It can damage our health. Every community of people deserve to live, to work, to play, to grow, to have their children live in a safe community. This property right here has been an eyesore for many, many years. And the fact that we're starting to do redeveloping in this area now, our concern was what was going to happen with this property because of all of the contamination. We like to say this is environmental justice in action. This is taking or turning blight into might. Um, and we're just really excited that we can be a part of it. The contaminants here go 40 feet underground. The hope is that once this area is remediated and redeveloped, it'll be a big boost for the neighborhood. This is the perfect storm, and I'm really excited that this to envision the possibilities of what will be here uh, when this is cleaned up. We look across the street, we have our beautiful West Ward Recreation Center that's just about to be reopened. We're excited about that. So movement is happening. Things are coming up here in our community. So having this property go along with it and it's being renovated, it's being knocked down, given the health issues concerned, that is important to us. We can't complete the, the whole ambiance of the community if we don't get this done. So this is imperative. The city of Trenton can find a developer to move in after the soil is cleaned up and the buildings are knocked down. Trenton is betting on finding new tenants for former industrial sites to give them and the city a brighter future. In Trenton, I'm Ted Goldberg, NJ Spotlight News.
In our Spotlight on Business report, a labor dispute goes to court. Two workers from a cleaning company that contracts with the American Dream Mall are fighting for their jobs, alleging they were fired in retaliation for organizing a union. The National Labor Relations Board is spearheading the case on behalf of the employees who say their lives are in limbo while the legal challenge plays out. Melissa Rose Cooper reports. It was a very surprising to me and unexpected. I had been prized for my work and I also was promised a, pro a promotion before they terminate me. The past year has been difficult for Luis Varela. He used to work for HSA Cleaning, spending his week cleaning the American Dream Mall. But last June, he was fired. Terminated for no reasons, just for their intention to organize our co-workers in the union. Which Varela says was necessary due to complaints from workers being mistreated on the job. So now the National Labor Relations Board is taking HSA cleaning to court, demanding Varela and his co-worker Jose Terran, who was also let go, be reinstated immediately. The time that I was employee, I never had any complaint or any issues, but after I started speaking, they decided to fire me. Representatives for both the NLRB and HSA appeared in federal court today in Newark. In court documents filed, the NLRB accuses HSA of firing Varela and Tehran in retaliation for organizing a union. But lawyers for HSA deny the claim, saying the company didn't even know the union existed until July when the petition was drawn to get their jobs back. Instead, HSA maintains that Varela and Tehran were let go due to necessary cuts in the workforce. I thought what he had to say was very unconvincing. Uh, the, he tried to argue that they had the more, um, HSA had good reason to fire the workers, but as I uh, said earlier today, not a single piece of paper supports the mall's, uh, HSA's position. These guys worked there for years without a single negative comment. In fact, uh, we see lots of um, praise for Luis in particular from the owner of the company, from the director of operations. That's what the written record shows, and uh, that's what's really convincing here. Brent Guerin is the deputy general counsel for SEIU Local 32 BJ. He says HSA has a moral responsibility to reinstate Varela in Tehran. They don't have uh, other jobs, and the workers at the mall have lost the uh, most uh, outspoken union advocates and they of course are afraid that if they stand up the other workers at the mall that the same thing will happen to them so it'd be a extremely important uh, way of sending the message to these uh, immigrant workers low-wage workers that they have the right to organize they have rights in this country when uh, Jose and Luis are returned to work. We reached out to HSA and a representative told us they have no comment at this time. The judge is expected to give his decision in the next couple of weeks. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Melissa Rose Cooper. Turning now to Wall Street, here's how the markets closed. And before we leave you tonight, air quality warnings have been issued again statewide as hazy skies return due to smoke from wildfires still burning in Canada. The air pollution is strongest in the southern half of the state. The National Weather Service lists most of that area as either unhealthy or unhealthy for sensitive groups. Now, that includes people with asthma, heart and lung disease, the old and very young. Medical experts are urging anyone with health concerns to wear an N95 mask or stay indoors. 
The air quality index is still nowhere near as bad as it was in early June. That's when the state reached an index of 458. 500, of course, is the highest and most hazardous. Meteorologists predict winds will shift Friday morning, lifting any lingering smoke, clearing the skies in time for the holiday weekend. That's going to do it for us, but a reminder to download the NJ Spotlight News podcast so you can listen anytime. I'm Brianna Venozzi for the entire NJ Spotlight News team. Thanks for being with us. Have a great evening. We'll see you tomorrow. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. New Jersey Realtors, the voice for real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at njrealtor.com and by the PSEG Foundation. Orsted will provide renewable offshore wind energy jobs, educational, supply chain, and economic opportunities for the Garden State. Orsted, committed to the creation of a new, long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. Online at us.orsted.com.